Uh, well, John, uh, pleasure to meet you for the first time here. I've been uh, here, Rod. Good to meet you, Bo. Yeah. Happy to have you on the show. So welcome to the welcome to Powerline Podcast. Yes, sir. I appreciate you having me on here, man. That's, I'd know nothing about this until I, I thought I had the groundbreaking idea. Here, here it is. It's already existing. So. It's like I was I'll saying. Here. Like I was saying to you, though, um, I've I've had a few people come to me and say, like, "Hey, I want to start a podcast." I'm like, "But but they're like, but I don't want to step on your toes." I'm like, hmm, "I don't I don't care." Like the more people talking right. about this stuff, the better, right? Like you said, you. That's exactly right. That's the way I, I believe. So it. many people that this still hasn't reached yet and i don't know i'm just i'm all for it how many fitness podcasts are out there in the world oh uh, <laughs> you <know>? yeah or <laughs> you know conspiracy theory or something like that yeah exactly. I, I agree with you i think it when i was a kid coming up everybody i knew was a lineman and there was so much pride in the industry you know what i mean that was that was it and if you wasn't on your way to be a line head you're just gonna be nothing you know what i mean i knew from a young age this is what i was going to do but a lot of guys don't have it. And uh, I had a family support system from the start. I can remember being a little old bitty kid out on the right of way with some old, old hands, you know, and my dad. And I, I learned how to climb when I was 13 years old. Yeah. But, and a lot of guys don't have that. So, what's, uh, what, where are you from? Where's home? I live in Oklahoma, Southeast Oklahoma. Okay. Yep. So, been here my whole life. Uh, uh, small town. Big town? Yeah, very. Yeah, I live in a small town in the Toka County. There are about 12, 1,400 people here. A lot of them don't even care for me, you know, so. <laughs> What's, uh. I'm right where I should be. You said your your father was a lineman as well? Yeah, yeah. My dad, he was John Goodson. He, uh, he was a uh, Vietnam vet. And then, uh, he got out of, in the early 70s. Started working transmission lines, did distribution too. And he worked on on the road until I was like nine or ten maybe and then he landed a job up here at McAllister at the Army base and he was allowed it for their very little base well, he run their substation and took care of their projects and there's still some really good hands up there working now and he was there for 18 years and then you know his heart gave out on him but yeah I'm second generation lineman all my uncles on both sides are, are lineman most of them are uh, I got a uncle that retired from Western Farmers. I got a uncle, he's a big wig for AEP, PSO. Another one, he's, uh, he runs, uh, I think it was Great Southwestern, he was working for last. You know, so, I mean, it's in my blood. Something you're destined to do. Yeah, yeah, I knew, like I say, I knew from a young age this is what I was going to do. I, I quit school at not, at 19. I got my wife pregnant when she was, we were in school then. Went to the Corpus, worked on a job down there, did eight miles of 138 reconduct, and I was hooked. I knew that then what I was going to do. So I come straight back to Oklahoma and walked in the door, quit school, worked in a feed store for 10 months <laughs> till my power line career started. <laughs> and that's where it took off, bro. I've spent some time uh, reconducting in Corpus as well. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah, I did. Uh, I was with a company called Mike J. Thiel. My first lineman was a man named Heath Young down there. My, blew my mind you know i mean i've never been that high off the ground or anything it was just a surreal experience it's, it still sticks with me to the day you know what i mean so uh, it that's, sounds that's like uh blue collars in your blood i'm i'm also a uh, second generation lineman father was a lineman um got lots of uncles and cousins in either the power line industry or electrical industry in some way shape or form it's the blue collars of my blood as well. I grew up in a small town in yeah. British Columbia, small small forestry and mining town in BC. Yeah, a lot of logging in the prairie, that's for sure. And you know, in a blue collar, that's a lifestyle, you know, a kind of mentality that should be pushed more. All all growing up, everybody would say, "Oh, you need to go to school, or you'll be like so and so over doing that." so-and-so's probably making more money than little you know and that's all i could think about growing up and i watched all these these blue collar guys working their you know their sales to death and just never got any you know accommodation for it to say hey good job on that because we need it you know, you know you can have all the college education you need and you still got to have somebody working in the sewer industry or somebody jacking phases or something you know you got to have it yeah it i just takes- think it should be promoted more it takes you're 100 right it takes uh 
it takes quality hands to make make sure the infrastructure is built and maintained in the country and it doesn't just happen right like there's people, right. there's people yeah. building this and i think it, it's on what's unfortunate for the the blue collar uh individual is that they tend to not get educated enough in like how to like work their finances and like those all those like little things so they end up looking broke in the end or end up broke in the end and uh i think a little more education on that side of things like how to how to run your finances how to do you know looking after your your mental health things like that are yeah are, mental health's a big issue right right we'll talk about that's that. a big issue there's a lot of guys out there dealing with it is a weight that you can't imagine, and they're dealing with it at all. Nobody wants to talk about the problems. And it's this... Uh, uh, it, should, it should be expressed more, because we, I, I've, I've been to more funerals than the first of this year from suicide than I ever should have. And, you know, and something's got to change about that. This needs to be highlighted more. What do you think... What, what's a way that you would change it? What's something that somebody could do? Man, I don't know. All the shit that I deal with is it's my own issue, and that's the way it is for everybody. There's, I don't think there's anything that anybody can do other than just let someone know that, you know, you ain't there alone. It, it, all you got to do is talk about it. And no matter what it is, just let somebody know what you're going through, and the moment that happens, it's, it's a weight comes off of you, you know what I mean? You're not... You're not buried it alone no more. You got somebody to carry the load with you. And that, and that makes a big difference, I think. And that's what a lot of guys, they do it. They don't talk, you know. And we should. We should talk more. I think so often, you know, a guy, come, a guy comes to work with a burden that he's carrying and he comes to work and he goes, okay, I, you know, I, we don't, I don't bring my shit to work. They'll say that to themselves or other people. I don't bring this to work. I just want to go to work and keep my head clear and do my job and it's like this only the only place that they can go to you know not have to think about the problem but the problem is still there and i think yeah it never goes more often than not like we talk briefly about brotherhood and camaraderie within the trades you know like that's almost those are the people that you should be talking to like this is your this is your family right exactly you know, if you got an issue you should be able to bring it up at work to the people you mm -hmm. care about and you know, you get some help, get it off your chest or whatever. Maybe find some help that way instead of holding it and pushing it down. I don't know. That's, yeah. that's what I've seen over the year. Yeah. If you're on a line crew, especially on hitch work, you spend more time with them than you do your family at home. True story. And you experience everything with them. So there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to talk about everything with them as well. But I get it. Some guys ain't like cats. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to be a bleeding heart or whatever or lay their problems on somebody. But a after a certain point, it gets serious. You know what I mean? But once, you, once a person starts thinking they're the issue and nothing they can ever do will make things better, that's when it starts getting dangerous because then they receive an option to, well, maybe, I'm, maybe me not being here no more is, is the best solution. Nobody wants that. How do you approach it? Do you come to work and talk to people you that you call? Oh yes, I'm an open book. I, I don't I have no secrets. I'll tell you my best day and my worst problem. I have none. And then I ask my boys too. You know, everything good, all good. I know, I know their families. You know, I mean, I ask about them because we're there together, and it's it's hard sometimes. I mean, it's hard. We just my very friend of mine, Jake, yesterday. He's a damn good guy. Sort of hear that. Oh. He was a good goal, man. Good as gold. You know what I mean? There was never a bad day when Jake was around. And then he just carried all these bad days around with him and never talked about it. You know what I mean? He'll be missed. I feel like uh, some people tend to hide behind humor. Um, and it's sometimes the funny guy, or, you know, they're that, that, that guy that's yeah. good to be around that. Yeah, it's, it's packing the demons. Yeah, it's funny how that is, too, you know what I mean? It just kind of shows you how 
how strong they are at the same time being able to carry something so heavy and not show it you know still be there to support others talk about this very thing with others yeah. and they go home and deal with it alone yeah i don't know what to do to change it you know it's been around just seems like it's getting worse nowadays well i think you just brought up some you, you just brought up a good point about leadership and and asking how your brother's doing right instead of just you know showing up at work and going okay well you know jake's dealing with his problems and i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna interfere or what can i do like i don't know maybe just needs a hug <laughs> like yeah maybe maybe he needs you to ask him how he's doing or if he can help or let him know that you're there for him i don't know that's a fact hmm. That's a fact, man. All it takes is encouragement, and that's on any aspect, gently, as far as your mental health or your day-to-day. -day. You know, an attaboy and an I care go a long ways. True story. So. Um, you said uh, you, you said you started climbing at 13 years old. Well, what did that What did that look like? Your old man just throw a set of apps in front of you and say, hey, get up yeah. that hole, or what, uh, what would that look like? Well, he had a he had his set that he worked with, and the night shed out back was his old set. But I just strapped him on, and started out in just hooks, you know what I mean? Just kind of free climbing up and down, and then I got a roll of guy wire off a guy that did his cold and some fish sticks and stuff. And I thought zip line. So then I need to learn how to climb and work. And uh, I got up back of an oak tree over at my mom and dad's house, and I, I fell off it twice, skipped myself up. I still got a couple scars on my chest right here where I had to really hold it. But after that, I figured out you stay on the pole, you'd be all right. And then we built zip lines all over the place. I've changed out yard lots of stuff around here. You know, just, I thought it was fun. But then it turned into work, you know, later on. Still went to run with guys like Joe Lee Hobson and shit. You try to climb behind that guy. He was born on a set of hooks. You know what I mean? He could be on a pair of hooks all day long. And I just thinking, man, I'm glad I started doing this when I did, because I might not be able to hang with that dude then, you know. Yeah, I, I can remember back from little old kid. We was building zip lines. Uh, I had a fish stick, eight foot fish stick, and then I put a horse halter in the end of it. And that was our seat. I strung three eighths guy wire all over the yard. We'd zip one tree and unhook, pin on, go to another tree. You know, no way. That's a good time growing up doing that. Um, did the old man just like look at you and smile like there's there's my boy? <laughs> yeah, he just. He, most of the time he was at work and then the rest of the time it was just long fast. As long as I wasn't hurt or tearing something up, he was happy about that. You know, was, I wasn't called in the scene. He was good to go. So he told me he was proud of me. I was working in Missouri right there before he died. He, he said, man, you come a long way. He said, yeah, I appreciate that. You know, and I've been really working for it the whole time. And, you know, it meant quite a bit when he told me that. And I, and I think about it, and I only got to where I'm at because I, all the time these old timers put in me. You know what I mean? They made me learn. Like, my uncle would come in the house and say, get your shit, we're leaving. And that was it. We were gone. You know, there wasn't no, you want to go to work or any of this. So I was I was out there forced to do it. And they, they spent their time on me, so I figure, hell, that's why I started doing this TikTok deal. I got down on my back, couldn't, you know, couldn't really do a whole lot. But I had a lot of shit in my head, so I just started, you know, just kind of showing off a little bit. At first, it was just basically just like a, let's just stay relevant, you know what I mean? Because I'd been down for so long and couldn't climb a pole or nothing. And then it turned into what it is now, you know. I'm getting better as, you know, as the channel's growing, I'm getting better with it. So I, I, think, it, I think it was meant to be, you know what I'm saying? I think it, I'm where I'm supposed to be at. I think you do a really good job with it, to be honest. Like, um, you you bring something to uh, social media from that old boy, you know, world that I think is really interesting, and it's I think it's lacking, to be honest. Like, I, I've got some sure. I've got some teenage boys, I have uh, a eighteen year old and a sixteen year old uh, boys, and man, like I I can say like I haven't brought that part to them like I, I was raised a little old school as well like it was the tail end right. of um the old boy mentality kind of like bringing me up in 
line work and it kind of phased into the new era, but I didn't, I didn't stick with that part. And I don't know if I passed that on to them. Like they're, they're just not as like, uh, it's tough. It's tough, man. It's tough. It's, I think of some of the shit that my uncles had me doing out there. And I think, my God, I'd never ask anybody to do that. No. You know what I mean? But just tell me hanging upside down on, on arms, taking rods off and shoes and stuff. It was like, is this really what we do every day out here for real? Yeah. Get it done, you know? But I wouldn't do that to somebody else. But there was also so. something inside of you that liked to do that, though. Like that. Yeah. There was something in something inside of me that got a hold of me when I was up on top of an 85 foot pole or something hanging upside. Hey, I wonder if we could get out on this arm and hang upside down. It was just something like, yep. I don't know. It just didn't phase you, but I don't see the same thing in a lot of the kids today. I don't, I don't see that same thing in them and I don't know how to get it there. So like what you bring to TikTok and to that kid, like my 18 year old scrolling away um, I think it's super interesting and, and they need to see I more of that. that because I can tell I talk to my wife about it sometimes. And I said, man, it's the young guys. I, get, I said, them old timers are probably tired of hearing my shit. And she said, well, it ain't for Leo. I said, yeah, you know, you're right. On, on it ain't side. for Leo. They, they none did their turf. We try to, I just want some more pride back into it. They wasn't nothing better than me when I was coming up. And it was just not just the job, but the mentality, the bravery, the, I mean, there wasn't nothing finer to highlight it, Bo. That was it. Yeah. And now it's just become another job, and I want to change it. That's the exact that reason. The job. Exact reason I started the podcast. I, I spent 15 years on the tools, and then I moved into some management roles and some stuff like that. And I was yep. like, uh, I remember, I remember growing up. So my my mother and father owned a power line company together. Um, my, so they would quite often have to put linemen up a, at their own house, right? Because the small, right. small company in a small town, uh, we didn't, per diem was difficult, things like that. So, you know, yes. we give them a bed to sleep in at our own house, feed them dinner. And so there was always linemen hanging around. I grew up listening to stories around the table of my dad sure. talking to linemen. <laughs> like, late, cool Best places story, they probably. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, places yeah. they've been, cool jobs they've worked on, the awesome people they met along the way, and I, I it's never something I wanted to do until I left high school. An old foreman for my father kind of pulled me aside and was like, "What the fuck? Are you, what are you doing?" Like he slapped me on the side of the head. Like, do you realize the opportunity you're missing by not, you know, getting an apprenticeship here with your old man and becoming a lineman? And I was like, "What do you mean?" Like it's idea. something that never even crossed my mind. Until I started to do it, I was like, okay, fuck, let's throw it. I started to do it and I was like, I really like this. And then I started accumulating my own stories. And that's when I was like, okay, I want to give back. I want to tell these stories. I want to, I want to do this in some way. I can't write books. So I'm like, let's, let's start a podcast. Let's share these stories. Let's pass on some of these lessons. Like let's, uh, you know, that's the reason I started the pod and I think it's cool. It's so cool. It's it's been so uh, cool. Well, I just appreciate when somebody shows you know a little pride in it mm-hmm. and wants to help. You know, get the word out. Hey, we're proud of this. You should be too. Or even, hey, this guy'll show you something if you pay attention to him. You know, that's that's what it's about right there. It used to be bragging rights. And I was one of the most egotistical men you would ever meet in your whole life last year just broke me down piece by piece you know and we're trying to get better and all just trying to do better trying to stick talk things gonna work out i think everybody's liking it so far absolutely i think i think i think i got put here you know for a reason but i've been working on getting this company going for over a year now and everything that Every reason to give up on it presented itself. You know what I mean? Every one of them, even back surgery. It was like, hey, you can't do this. This guy's wanting to hey, hand. You can't be a hand no more. But man, it was just like once something presented itself to stop, this is your time to get out. Something just said, no, nah, just, just ride a little bit longer, see what happens. And then things just fell right into place. And here we are, you know, it's. It's, it's happening right now and, it, it, and nobody hurting over it. So I'm going to keep trying for what we got. And 
just kind of trying to just keep making myself better along the way, you know. And maybe I'll pass on some to some of these other guys, you know. And if nothing else, just a cool story or a little bit of pride, you know. Like I said, I think you bring something so, really unique to to the world, and um, I like how you, I like the the position that you come at it from. You come very neutral, right? It's like. I've seen you talk, you know, you've had to, you've had to breach the subject of union, non-union, right? You know, yeah. that that's a wormhole that, that oh, you can go down it. and it gets really bad, right? But you come at it very kind of neutral and it's like, you know, like with some yeah. hair and like, just, just, this so, is all it is. Yeah. 10, 15 years ago, I argued like crazy with these union boys. Yeah. I was a fool. I hated it. And like I kicked off a line of the bar on Facebook, such a dull ass. And it was for nothing. We're jacking the same wire, the same oil, same gloves. Hell, our gloves get tested at the same place most times. It's a personal choice, and and all that was was just causing tension in the in the ranks. You know what I mean? We're all on hands, union, non-union. You know how the union can help make us better if we just listen. You know what I mean? One of those kind of deals. But I'm not gonna judge a man for whatever he chooses. He's out there being alive just like me. So, yeah. jack away, old boy. What, what I think you bring to it as well is, um, especially these young people, they get, when they find our job, I, I'm finding this, when they find line work, they immediately find out what you can make dollars wise. And it's really great. I will talk about the money. I will tell them about the money that you can make because it is definitely a great selling point. It's a great feature of what we do, but it's not it. It's. It's about brotherhood, camaraderie, family, like work, blue collar work, you know, blue collar lifestyles, like putting your boots on in the morning, taking them off at night, you know, put in a hard day's work, physical labor, building infrastructure, you know, keeping a country moving forward. It's, it's all, that's a country lifestyle. <laughs> that's what it's about. Yeah. yeah the, the money's a solid bonus to that, but it's not what it's the only thing that it's about. But these yeah, young, uh, these young guys, yeah. I got a young guy working for me. He's from California, and uh, this guy's a genius. I don't know how he's with me uh, for the life of me. I can't figure out. This guy's Pentagon material. I mean, he's as smart as they come. And he was telling me, he's like, you know, Goody, he said, uh, he said this ain't one of them jobs where you got to lay in bed at night wondering if you made a difference during the day. Yeah, I said, what do you mean? He said, well. He said, I don't got to convince myself that I'm on the right path. And I said, well, you're right. You are on the right path. And there's no convincing needed. You know what I mean? I just never heard it put like that for him just to have that random thought, you know, and it, he's right on the money. You don't have to worry about whether you made a difference tonight or not because you did. And you know you did. Yeah. But I mean, just one of those deals brings the pride into it. It's kind of a. Kind of a two-way street because it's easy for me to get way too proud real fast. You know, I got an ego problem, but I've been trying to balance being proud of my job and these guys without being dismissive or arrogant to others in the process. You know what I mean? To try to find that happy balance right there. That's all. Go keep everybody happy and proud of it all at the same time. I, th I think that that's the lineman's journey, to be honest. Uh, you know, like that linemen you know the, the way that they were raised as as linemen um the way they came up is usually you know the way this is the only way <laughs> you know that's right like it's the only way to do it this is the only way to spin a preform all <laughs> this is the only way to spin rod or like whatever it is they all got our way <laughs> God, yeah there's a lot of ways to skin a cat <laughs> That was one of the hardest things I ever learned how to do was to let somebody else set a pole without me telling them what to do. Yeah. And I know that don't sound like a lot, but for me to take on a hand and he's my guy now, he's my foreman or whatever, and to watch him do this his way and me not step in was absolutely one of the most hardest things I've ever done in my life. It was just like, I mean, I'm over playing my pub all around like a lasso and just trying to keep from getting in it, and they did it. They got the pole set, went over about their way, and nobody got hurt, and it was done quickly. And once I figured out that, I was like, all right, well, hey, there's more than one way to skin a cat. You know, they may not be the fastest way like mine, but they're skinning it. So I still carried that little bit of arrogance with me, but I was working on it. 
See, that's another yeah, that's yeah, another sign. Of, that's another sign of a good leader, and that's something the leaders have to do is like you add their input, but then also like detach, step back, and let your let your boys, let your crew do what they need to do to get it done, you know, and then step back in later and provide some counsel or help them, you know, or whatever, whatever yeah. that looks like. But yeah, I'll do that. I'll step in there and say, oh, man, I, I'll catch one of my boys harder than another one for something. And it's nothing personal. It's just in the situation this happened and it, it caused a reaction. And I'll tell him, all right, now you need to go over and tell him what that was about and why. So he ain't carrying something around with him all day. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people, they freeze right up and go to yell and holler after they jump set. Yeah. So uh, you kind of need to keep that communication going. I know I got loud while go, but it was because of this situation here. And this is what we needed to do to fix it. You know, and that'll that'll help out a lot as far as keeping you guys self aesthetic. Nobody wants to fight. So, yeah, 100%. Um, this, uh, I found this, I do a lot of work with trying to get uh, vet veterans into line work because I I feel that it really, uh, it's a good transition. I think like career wise, not that line works, anything like the military, but if you want something that's somewhat relatable, it, it really does translate and relate nicely. So, um, yeah, I've been trying to get as many veterans as we can into this community because I think it's a good, it's a good transition for them. It's good. Yeah. The structure and the pecking order. A lot of these military guys, I know some damn good lab editor, you know, XGIs, and that's what they got in here for was uh, one old guy told me, he said, he held the army, he said, we don't get an opinion. He said, that's the way I like it. So we we left off talking about, uh, vet- a bit about veterans. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with a couple of really good programs to help get vets into the industry. Yeah. And, uh. I just find that it's like, it's a great transition, transitional job for veterans. And I've been just like promoting and trying to get the word out there for vets because I per- personally witnessed like helping the vet get in, like fine line work, get into a program and then come out the other side of it going, this is just an amazing career. I'm so glad I found this and to see it kind of change their life. Yeah. I think a lot of it's back in order. A lot of structure out of line, you know what I mean? Yes, you. GF and all the way down to, you know, your apprentice and everybody's got their spot and so some of them old men that they, they you know, I mean they ain't they ain't asking you to do nothing, they're giving orders on what to do out there. So I think that might be why a lot of the military boys relate so well to the job. I kinda of so. find uh I kinda of find that it's um some life experience as well. You know, that yep. that age group, you know, if you're coming out of the military and you're 24 25 26 years old or 28 years old like a lot of yeah. 24 to 28 year olds now still don't even they haven't done anything <laughs> they still yeah, haven't been tested in, a, in the moment when they need it well yeah. yes i understand that completely right. don't really uh yeah. don't really um uh, like authority figures either or <laughs> people telling them what bad i was the world's worst that i was always oh god bad for that, but I always had something to say about a drill sergeant, you know what I mean? But my, my dad was a non vet Well, he got fired up. You didn't say nothing. You listened to what Rugg said, <laughs> and that's the way it was. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I talked a lot, but in reality, I probably wouldn't have said much in person. A little bit. Yeah, I was the same way. I was a hot kid. I wasn't going to listen to no drill sergeant or none of that stuff. But it's funny how that happens. <laughs> I, I remember, and I tell this story quite often, is like, I, I remember... F- flying up and down a pole like i was 22 or whatever flying up and down a pole i was coming down fast you know five steps to the ground and i had this old timer kind of looked at me and looked up at me and he's like i hit the ground and he's like what the fuck are you doing and i was like what what do you mean he's like if you keep doing that you're not gonna have knees or a back yeah you won't be able to keep there (laughs) and i was like whatever i kind of rolled my eyes and walked away and yeah i wish i would have listened to him because both my knees and my back are right. <laughs> yeah, I think that all the time when I, when I look back on going up, is that's all they ever told me was, you know, lift properly and this and that. And my dad was the world's worst about lifting something properly, you know, and then here I am with probably one of the worst bites in the market. So, so what did you do? It's so nice to listen to him. What did you do to hurt your back? What's the span? I think it was just, I got a disease i guess they call it degenerative disc disease so 
it's always kind of been an issue. But it started, I think, after a car wreck that I had a few years ago. I was working for a guy named Chet, and uh, I wrecked a pickup of his. We was headed to job one time. And of course, I was an old I was, and I, I'm not your average dude, so of course, when it happened, you know, it was. I guess pretty serious, and I just refused all kind of medical treatment. You know, I've got a truck, and we went on to work. That's just the way I, I dealt with it then. And I never brought nothing back on the company. I never faulted anybody at all. You know, that was that was my deal. And right after that's when I started having my back trouble. I started having uh, sciatic pain in my hip. And I, I just thought it was, you know, pain. So I was doing yoga downward facing dog and all this stuff for a couple of years you know just trying to get by and, and then he got better I woke up one day and wasn't nothing there and then i went two or three months rock and roll bam it went started getting mad again i did that twice and then by initial what did it was i was at work and i grabbed a case of water out of the shopping cart we go stick it in the back of the truck boy i give her a good yank and i collapsed i turned the parking lot in gainesville Crawled to the truck, you know, and toughed it out. But I knew right then that this was what like before, you know. I mean, it would it would keep, keep me from breathing for a little bit until it, I guess, the nerve let off. And so we had we had to do the surgery route. But yeah, I dealt with this for shoot, 2016, 2015, somewhere around there. You know, is when it all started, and it just got worse and worse. If I'd have took better care of myself, and probably did the know the right physical therapies and stuff i might not have been here but what's what some, what's some advice know. from that um you know like take care of yourself i said you did some yoga some stuff like that and it's like is there yeah, so i do a lot of that flexions and stuff uh just yoga poses anything that hurts a muscle when you're stretching it is supposed to be good for you so i did a lot of that stuff and it never seemed to work but as far as taking care of yourself man don't lift it on your own I was bad about, I'm tall enough I could put my knees on the front of the bucket, my feet on the back of it, and damn near lay flat out, you know what I mean? And I was bad about that, and it, I think that took a lot of toll on my lower back as well, because I always feel a strain now when I'm reaching out and leaning. I feel that the most, you know, down in my lower so You can't, you're not a machine, you know, I don't care what you think you are, you're not going to be, be good forever, so. Yeah, forty years I think is a little young to start. Yeah, you know, I'm trying. I'm trying to relive how, to relearn how to do everything. And I think it's a little, a long time to go for a man to figure out how to redo this shit. So, yeah, sure, absolutely. take care of it. You know, I did an episode with uh, my personal trainer. Um, it was a couple weeks back, a few weeks back now. His name is James Greenwood. Uh, I started going to a personal trainer that focused more on mobility and like functional movement not just the gym bro go to the gym and do some right. single activation exercises this is like um we try to replicate movements for life because yeah i'm 42 now as well and you know yeah. abused my body on on the line didn't listen to anybody telling me any advice i'm trying to like <laughs> rectify that now and correct some of that stuff <laughs> focus on yep. on movement and i don't know that's, that's what a lot of it is too Anything joint related or shoulders, back, you know, knees. If you're doing the proper muscle training and strength training around that area, the majority of the time it's not going to be you know, the focus on the injury. But it's easy for you know a working man to just not worry about that and think, well, you you know, I'm getting plenty of muscle training out here on the job, but it's not that specific area. And what what I didn't know is the whole time I was working, thinking I was doing good, I was actually building muscle around everywhere else but that area just protected it you know what i mean trying to just keep from from using it and then that that too made it worse and if i uh, yeah if i'd have done a proper muscle training and muscle memories on things like you're saying it probably would have been different tenfold yeah that's a good point my father always used to say that as well as my my dad was a lineman he always used to say i don't need to go to the gym he's like i get enough i get enough working out on the job and <laughs> He's also got a broken body right now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I'm as strong as a bull, but and only for a second. <laughs> that stuff starts hurting when I go to use it myself now. And that's, that's the thing that I thought I was a machine. That's the thing that people don't realize is that 
Joe Rogan said it the other day, is getting old is a fight to keep tissue. And the most important thing you can do is keep muscle. Because muscle equals movement. Movement equals life. It's just so true. Watching people get old and watching muscle and tissue deteriorate and shrink. And then they just start to yeah. lose life after that. It's so sad. So as long as you can hang on to that show, keep it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's definitely right, man. Um, that is exactly right. Eating right makes a lot of difference too. What's that? No, I said eating right makes a lot of difference too. I know that's a big deal on live inside, but we don't need worth damn. These yeah. boys are sticking whatever they can in their body and washing it down with Red Bull. You know what I mean? Or monster. So that's that takes a lot on your body as well. That's the, that affects your stamina through the day, you know, and your calorie intake. So. I figure if you're not eating right, you're doing something to keep going, and that might be too much, and that'll, that'll lead to an injury. I worked with this old boy named, uh, we named, we called him Cookie. Um, his last name was Cook uh, in South Texas, and he'd show up in the morning for the morning safety brief, and, and he's drinking a big, like a, it was an extra tall monster, full sugar-loaded monster. And I'm like, dude, Cookie, man, it's like 6.45 in the morning. What the fuck are you doing? He's like, <laughs> he's like, ah, oh, I need something to wash down the pot of coffee. And I was like, wow, dude, you're going to have a jammer. And we're like two weeks later. Oh, uh, two weeks later, had a, had a jammer, survived it, but. Really? Like, had a heart attack, too. Yeah, That's how my dad went out. I heard a massive coronary to sleep. No heart won't last forever. That's the sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was doing everything right though. He went on a diet. He lost a bunch of weight. He he cut down on all the carbs, and he just sat in there eating, and drank beer, and just go to sleep. You know, go to work, and bam, old heart just shot that with it. So it's what you do over all this time. Right? So, you can yeah. go on a diet. You can lose weight. You can start to get healthy. But it's like, what have you done for years, not just days? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, he was a hard cool man. So it happens. Since we're on this topic, what's your thought? What's your thoughts on safety in the trade? I think it's progressed a lot, but so I'm kind of torn on the way safety is nowadays. It's... A lot, a lot of these, a lot of the answer to the safety dilemma we have is just more cover, just throw more cover and more cover, and it's not more trailing. Start a discussion on what happened and what exactly this guy did to get there. Which I know that's a hard discussion to have yeah. to talk about how somebody ended their cell with an incident. But I feel like instead of just covering it all up and saying this is what we do now, that issue should be addressed more. It should be focused on and seeing the steps that he made to get to where he was at. You know what could have been done differently. I get asked a lot on on that page of mine. Do you want to put a gut on your phase when it's in the in the wire hammer on the jip. No, I don't, because it is made to not have a gut in there with it. Because we all know that that's going to be energized, so we're not going to touch it. That's the way I was trained at. You don't touch this because that's hot, and we don't mess with it. And we're not going to go over and mess with it just so we can have some cover on it, because that's just creating more potentials going in and out of a tight spot. And I feel like that's what's driving a lot of these guys away from the industry is 45 minutes of cover up in 105 degree heat. They're dead before they ever get started jacking wire. And then you got safety man and GF and everybody down there represented for the company. And they're only wanting the picture from the ground to look good. You know what I mean? Drink water. Here's you some, here's you some electrolytes. No, we need to be training these men on what's up there. That way when they're journeyed out, they're not in gloves and sleeves, tied in A1s, demoralizing themselves and dying, putting on cover. You know what I mean? That's just my personal opinion on it. And I follow any safety rules on any property that I get on. And I don't question them either because that's their property and that's their rules. But at the same time, I feel like those rules are why we don't have any hands. Why it's so hard to get a lineman to stay with it because, man, Southeast Oklahoma covering up for AP is absolutely a nightmare. Two guts on each phase, each side of the pole, gut on the neutral. And that's just a set one. That's a lot of work for one man to do, you know what I mean? Absolutely. One is 105 degrees, but at the same time, there's a lot of guys that that feel comfortable with their cover and they want to use it because that's the way they was trained. So mm -hmm. I'm, that's why I say I'm torn in it. You know, I, 
I can't tell anybody what to do. I just got suggestions for myself, I guess. Well, you bring up a good point, though, is like uh, you, you default to your level of training. And so if your level of training is really poor, you get to your, you get yourself towards a situation or in a potential situation, you're just going to default to your level of training. And places like you look at places like the military and what they spend on training people to do a somewhat dangerous job and the efforts they go to into training. And then you look at something like line work, it's got a very good track record in history of, you know, not quite putting in what they should for its level of danger, putting in the training that it should for its level of danger. But it's tough because it's like, who does that, who does that burden fall on the, on the training side? It kind of falls. There's no the real way to get, yeah, there's no way to get a certification or a test out on a hand that can go up, help safely jack a C8 and, you know what I mean, not have to have a gun on everything up there and a blanket on everything that's wire. And there should be a level to where a man progresses to get there, but it's hard to, it's hard to test that. I get it. You know what I mean? It, it's hard to judge, to gauge something like that other than just let the man go, you know. That's why I try to get up there with my guys, you know, show them what I do in the situation. That way they can understand where everything is at in, in the moment and they get a better understanding of it. Because you can talk a guy to your blue in the face. If he ain't getting it, he's not getting it. But there's so much so training that, that's just like ticky box training as well, you know, like, and that's why, that's why linemen don't like to go to the safety training a lot of the time because all they see it as is, oh, okay, it's a paid day off, basically. You got to go sit in the shop and put your feet up and watch some PowerPoint yep. that doesn't relate to anything just so that the safety team can tick that box. Say, oh, yeah. So we got them here. Yeah, we got them here. We trained them. Uh, it's not training. It's not training. It's got to be real world. The orientation videos, yeah, we know them by heart. From yep. Elliot to Versified, all these, you know, all these contractors. He hire old go there, watch five inch video. Everybody give him a nap through the middle of it, and then off to work he went. And it become it, it become repetitive. You know what I mean? You knew exactly what the video was going to show, damn near which one in order this going to be. And I don't know. It's just a little, just a little different now. Well, I, I haven't hired off. The last time I hired off for a company, we did a. Uh, of course, it was a real small outfit then. We just did applications like old school, do our W-2s and everything. You know, we had a little big hair to go over kind of expectations of the company, and we was tired of loose. There, I guess that was the orientation, you know, but as far as trainings go, and they're rare, it's it's rare to actually sit down and get a, a training course with somebody. You see more training on shit on TikTok than you do in a lot of companies that's, you know, Cause they're, they're out there working They're not shutting down jobs, taking half a day to train a guy up on the proper way to do anything. You know what I mean? That, that's the only job training they're getting as they go. So it is, it's very hard to get that, that tedious level of training that a hand needs to, you know, to really be a good hand. Lots of hands don't like to do further training either. And like, this is where a lot of responsibility falls upon the individual themselves, right? They figure, okay, I, I did right. my apprenticeship. I, you know, did my three and a half, four years, I'm out, I'm a JL now. All right, I'm good. I, I don't need to do any more training. I know everything already or whatever the scenario is, but like, yes. man, it, the responsibility lies on you too. It's like, you, there's lots you can read and study and, you know, work practicing your head, even going over scenarios to, yep. to try to avoid some of those things. It's that, I could go, man, a, a star, the more you know. And no matter what it is, if you, you pick up a little knowledge on it, do it. You know what I mean? I worked with some Bible guys one time, and it wasn't even my job. They were just on the same pose we were on. So, hell, I helped them out just to get a feel of, you know what I mean, the lasher and all that stuff. So, yeah, don't be scared of training. And you're right, it is the guys. A lot of guys don't want to. They've done it a few times, and they don't want to know another way to do it. They might save them a couple minutes. And, and, and you know what? I, I know 30 seconds here or a minute or two here don't seem like that much, but you saving three minutes, 10 times a day, you know what I mean? Five, six times a week. And then through the month, you're saving time over the year by just changing that one little step right there. And 
I want a bid job. That, may, I, that makes a lot of difference. I'm going to tell you that right now. I mean, a lot of a lot of guys don't understand what a bid is for you know like utilities or co-ops, but you want a bid job. Every second counts. Yeah, no dawdling on the line or none of that stuff. That's why these little tricks and trades and stuff that they really come in handy. Yeah, help you might come in under budget. That way, ain't nobody breathing down your neck. Yeah, it's, and you know, like you look at look at fatigue and fatigue management too. Like if you're doing things the hard way and you could save save a step or two and save some fatigue on your own body and mind and you know potentially save an incident as well in that way too because you saved yourself an hour during the day and that was the hour that you would have been exhausted i don't know it goes on yep. you got to think about those things too. yeah that falls a lot into pole framing like how you put your top row a lot of guys put their spool up top run it off and run it back up there and nail it and then pull it tight. And, it's, and if you flip it around, you nail your tail first and drag it down. It saves you a whole other trip or two up at pole. And like you said, that's a couple of minutes. That's an hour at the end of the day, you know. That that shit adds up. So, yeah, that that's on the job training, and that should be left up to your journeyman in the form. And if you're, a good, if you're a good crew lead, not just a boss, if you're actually a leader, that's what you're doing. You're trying to get these guys to the best that you can get them. Because it's only going to benefit everybody, so that's where I stand on that. I uh, I worked for Quanta Services for the better part of ten years. I did uh, I did their bare hand course. Oh, cool. uh, their their bare hand course is second to none. It's probably the the best secondary training I've ever had or ever gone through, uh, other than just going through my my normal journeyman ticket. Um, it was two weeks of like intense on the job, real world scenario training where like you, if you fail, you fail. Like they turn, they drive to the airport and they send you home, fail, send you home. Yeah. Fail your exams or you fail on the job site. It's like, and it's all just as this mock fail. job site. And this is free or not pay for this? It's, it's free. The criteria is you got to work for a quanta company. Uh, and, yeah, so they're yeah. so they're like a mother mother over a bunch of branch. Exactly. So, yeah, you your and then as long as you're affiliated, service, yeah, those those yeah. sorts of companies. So if they if say if Par has a a bare hand job, um, and you, they they're trying to ramp up their bare hand crews, that's where you could like stick your hand up. And there's a bit of an application process to get into it too, right? right? It's not just first come first serve. There's a bit of an application process, so it's pretty selective. You get into this select group, I think. You know, Quanta's got 50,000 employees, and I think they've only, they're just shy of 2,000 bearhanders in the course of their entire history. So, really? yeah, it's, it's a, well, it's a tight select. course. Yeah. And very, very, very good training, though. Like, I've, I've never, and some of the things I learned in that training, such as um, just like the way you would run a job procedure. So, um, you write your procedures step by step by step so that anybody on the job, uh, anybody that comes onto the job, like a safety guy or anybody comes onto the job, you give them the procedure, they can look at it and then go, okay, looks like you're on step seven. And it's just detail followed out in detail like that. That's cool. Uh, and if there's any, if there's any changes to that job, everybody stops, you stop work for a few minutes, you, you all get on the same page. You write the new step in there, you all agree on it, and you sign off on it again. So it's like, it has to be that way. It has to be very, like, methodical to, you know, it's a high level of risk if you don't. But it, I, I like taking that and kind of applying it into even distribution or whatever, you know? Like, it's not going to be, yeah, you know, it's not going to be as detailed, but I like that, you know, if there's a job change, stop work for a sec, bring the bucket down, get your groundman, get everybody on the same page. You know, verbally yeah. sign off on it and go back to, to doing what you're doing. That's what we got this book for. Exactly. We got a old job, the old tailboard briefing. They get on there, everybody gets on the same page, and if something changes and then nobody likes it, then we stop what we're doing and we crack that old book open and revise it. But it's another thing. It doesn't thing go to that, anybody either. Yeah. Nobody gets the sheet. That's just for us on the job. That way we know where the hospital's at, what, who's in charge of what, who's watching. And who's calling? You know all all that shit. Then that's, that's only for us. So it's another thing though, that a lot of a lot of hands don't take serious enough. Though is that book? You know they just it's yeah. it's a ticky box ticky box thing. Their safety guy makes them do, and they don't take it serious enough as they should. Yeah, I was one of those guys that we got a 
got a line knocked out down there in South Texas and uh, started a big old grass fire right here by a schoolhouse. And I wasn't familiar with everything around me. And I, for a little bit, I didn't know who to call or where to call or where to send them. You know what I mean? And it was an eye opener. I got lucky. Nobody got hurt. They didn't even get a sunburn and they disappeared in the fireball big as a pickup. But I learned a lesson that day and that, that JSA is pre it's pretty serious part of the job now. You know what I mean? That's, that's what's going to get you out of there if something does go bad. Because in that moment, nobody really knows anything. They're frantic. You try to wrap your mind around what you just saw, try to put it all together. The book's important. You know, it is very important because it, it knows. It's right there with it all rope out. So, yeah. It's amazing how real things get really fast, right? Fast. Boy, there's a bike of an eye. And that's, again, like you default to your level of training, right? So even in, that's like, it's a great example too. Like even in um, emergency scenario training, you know, how many people actually drill, you know, emergency scenarios and act them out like a real emergency so that you can yeah. prepare as best you can if that, in, if, if an incident does happen, you can deal with it as quick and efficiently as possible, staying as calm as possible. Lots of people don't do that. And they panic, they react, they think they're going to react different yeah. than they do, but man, that adrenaline spikes, things go sideways. And we yeah, it's just something there, how they... It's not fun to experience, man, especially when you're, you know, in charge of it all. It's just, it'll humble a man real quick, you know, it'll make you, if you've never been to things you had going that weren't worry totally about the situation in front of you. Do you have any near misses or incidents that you'd, you'd care to talk about that you learned a lesson from or could share a lesson on? Uh, yeah, I got one, uh. Well, I got a bunch of them actually. Uh, just, uh, I know an old boy. This must be, I guess, the lesson on but knowing where you're at on the job site. You know what I mean? Staying out of the way. There's a, I know this old hand that was, they, they were working a sister crew to us up in the mountains. And, uh, old Buck was standing out in front of the digger truck and they just rolled the auger down. And the auger strap broke, snap, and just barely clipped it. Peek. Hit him in the head. They had to fly a helicopter out there to get him, you know, all of that stuff. And it was all because they wasn't paying attention. You know, he didn't, he wasn't paying attention to where he was at. And, and that's something that we learned from. After that, every time somebody hits that auger lever, and they going to auger, you know, get out of the way. Because we all know what happened to Buck at that moment. Which it was, it was a common thing to say before then, because that's just the way we were trained. But we never experienced that situation until then. Got to the effect of, you know, him being hurt, the helicopter, or him being down a man, the rest of the hitch. You know, I mean, all that shit culminates to make it a reality to you. I think old Buck's still alive. Uh, I know he ain't working. I, he, he, he messed him up pretty good. He lived through it, though. But I don't know how well he lived through it. And, and, you know, there's just tons of situations like that where you're one minute, things are good, going your way. But it can be anything. Rig and break, a hook pop up, hit a guy, or outrigger sick. It's, it's a it's a, it, endless possibilities of dangers out there. And the only way you can do it is just mitigate them as best you can visually, and then be prepared. You know, to change the scope of it. Even if you've got an inkling that something's going to be wrong, get everybody together and let them know what we're thinking about here, because. It's better to do that than it is to let it go wrong and have to sit there and put it all back together. That's no fun. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I mean, I, I talk about this quite a bit too, is it, this trade had, deals with everything, a lot of different things that can get you compared to a lot of other industries or jobs out there. You know, you got heavy equipment, high voltage electricity, heights, traffic, I don't know, just name anything. <laughs> hydraulics like air <laughs> there's a lot of things that can get you in this in this job that's why we talk about it so much yep yeah, yeah. Uh, traffic's a good, a good one too that's that's probably our most one of our largest days we just get two of those jobs up that's what's killed off most of the hands i know traveling 
So it's to to and from the job site as well as just being on the job site. I worked yeah. with a, a guy down in South Texas as well that later after that job, a few months after that job, he was just working on the side of the road. It was off the side of the road, like in on a meridian, like well off the side of the road. And yeah. Car just went off the road, went right into the crew of three of them and got them all. And like, no chance, no chance. Like it was, like it was destined to or something. It's yeah. weird. Yeah, it's yeah. tense. You can do all the things right sometimes. You know, you're talking about uh, production and productivity. What's your what's your favorite productivity hack? You kind of talk about a few things on your channel, which is interesting. So I'm, I'm curious to think, what are your you know your top two or three productivity hacks? Productivity hacks. Oh, uh, you can do this fancy armor rod <laughs> thing that you like to show people. Yeah, we got the rods. I got I got a certain technique I like to use to shovel, but I'm. You know, backfill the hole. I'm not a scooper. I do it like I'm rolling a boat because you can really get down on the ground, fill your shovel, and, and I can move more dirt than anybody I know, even when the bust is back. And it's because I use that technique. You know, and that's a time saver. You're not out there spending 10 minutes crowding this hole up. I can break, I can break two taps that, that quick shoveling like this. John Farrell's the guy that taught me how to do it. He chewed my ass out. I was shoveling, picking at it. He said, no, no, get out here at the edge of the dirt. Like you rode a boat to the hole, and man, and he was right. It worked. I, and from then on, that's the only way I moved dirt. So that's one of them. The armor rods, you know, just little tricks on tying. You know, having your shit together before you go up, having a process. I'm gonna do this, 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 bam, and then I'm on the ground. That way, you're not going up and down and up and down. Another one that eats me alive is that bucket not rolled around to the end of the boat. And then, I, and then a hand I want to sling over this far, like it made any difference in his reach. That, that one there wears on me more than I'm like, roll that bucket out there where it belongs, and let's get where we can reach something. And, and that's that's probably my main stigler piece right there. You get that bucket where it's supposed to be and, and mark to where, I know this old hand named Jules, it don't matter where the bucket's at, he can reach it. And I like that about him. He get up there close, and he can reach every bit of what he's doing because he's he know he understands. And, and I think that's one one deal right there that the speed alignment up a whole lot is getting where you can work everything in one set and not move the bucket three or four inches to do this, just, you know, three or four inches to do that. That's a time saver right there, for sure. I, I like those. I, I really like the one of uh, being prepared as well. Like I, yep. you see, so many guys. Um, just want to jump up in the bucket right away. I, I need to get in the bucket. I need to get upstairs and you start doing something without a clue, without a plan, without all of your yeah. shit together, without yeah. talking to your ground, <laughs> crown hands. So get, get together on the ground, talk about That's it, right. lay all your shit out, make sure your ground hand has his shit together and knows what he's got to lay out. Yeah, What's knows what he's doing. Knows what he's doing. Knows what you're doing up there so that he can prepare for you to come up and down and get shit. Um, and then get it laid out, get all your shit together, then go up. You're going to save time, you know, effort. You're not going to be traveling up and down and up and down and up and down. Uh, yeah. I learned at 26, I'd go up there. I wouldn't have not be hollered out about See, like, my uncle's grunting my truck. So I didn't get to be mean to my grunts. They was back. It's vice versa. It's better and shit to me the whole time. So I'd holler for something. Well, you go up there with just an idea? I, you know, I guess so. <laughs> and I, I'd have to come down and put a plan together. Or the pole, you know what I mean? And once I figured that out, that saved me a lot of time. I set my truck up, get what I needed, and go. For it, and I had what I needed, you know what I mean? So having that plan and having all your shit is very important as far as bucket work goes. What's the what's your proudest job that you've worked on? One that you go out. Our proudest job. Uh and I I got some, I guess they're more memorable than anything. We did a, we did a 1272 job out there west of Amarillo for a company called Tesco. Had a good time on that job. Uh, we built five miles of 477, 14.4 up in the Yakima Mountains in Missouri. Oh, my first distribution gig, I was, you know, I had a lot of memories on that one. What's the Yakima Mountains? You know, I kind of broke in on it there and did good, so. Those those two probably stick out the most. The rest of them were just, you know, just little jobs here and there. But those those two stand out the most. 
What advice for uh, advice for youngsters or new guys do you have? I see that a lot on your channel as well. I like to give advice for these young guys. We talked a little bit about it in our first conversation too. Yeah. Just stay hooked up, man. There are going to be days when you wonder if it's worth it or not. And you're going to be asking, do I really want to be out here? Yeah, you do. Uh, tip two is find a crew that cares about you. I mean, uh, I see a lot of this nowadays where they'll hire an operator to come work for a crew and he doesn't fit. You know, it's just the whole, the whole, everything about it. Those two types of people just wouldn't jive and he never stayed with that crew. So it's, that's, that's one of my biggest pieces of advice. Find a crew that you can be a family with, you know, that you fit with. Because you can hire all with some guys and they'll make life hell on you just because you don't fit in with it. You know, same company, same shirt, everything. But you're just not, you know what I mean? And, and some of them crews are playing up and get tight with each other, so you need to have that same mindset when you're going out looking for one. You'll try to give it somebody that cares about you. Because it'll make it my heart if not. I get asked that question a lot from young guys who they've got into the trade, but they haven't become an apprentice yet. They keep They keep asking me, like, why do I keep floating around? Why can't I get into the trade? And I tell them like, find a sponsor, just like you said, find a sponsor, find a, find a family within the trade, do really yeah. good for one guy. That's like a foreman and just do really, really good. That's not in a, not in a brown nosing and ass kissing way, but do the things that he needs done without question, without expectation, just do them and do them well. Yeah. Best of your ability, head down, ass up, just do them and just watch how it turns around. That guy it's a, gets, a gets big pull on job choices, crew choices on the job, all of that sort of thing. You'll find yourself always on the good jobs, always with that crew, yeah. and life will go a lot easier. Find us all this how you fit in. You got a mesh, and when it once it happens, man, it's like a symbiosis. And my, we're we're all family on my crew. You know, we'll bicker and argue, and oh, yeah. but that that doesn't mean that he say you know what I mean. We're just like a family. We fit well. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, just like a family, man. But yeah, that would be my advice. Find a good crew that cares, man. What's some other advice for the kids? Uh, I'm sure you're starting to get the questions a lot as well from guys that are finding the trade. How do I get into this? How do I do it? What's the advice for that, for that guy? So I had a, a lot of them are saying that it's just damn near impossible to get in without line school. And a, I, I believe it nowadays, the way, the way things have gone, which is, they're trying to, you know, tighten up the safety area. And I don't know. I don't know, man. If it's better just to try to get a CDL and try to go to your local co-op or utility and, you know, or apply that way. Or if you got a union hall, that's the way to go there. I got a lot of guys telling me that they're going to liar up out the door at their union hall, though. So it's, I mean, it's not guaranteed on either side, really. You know what I mean? You could pull up on a contractor with a CDL on the day that they're needing the operator or a grunt and be the man for the job. But then, and then it could take another five years for that situation to ever present itself again. You know what I mean? I would put in an application everywhere I could. I would try to make friends with my meter man. When I see him reading my meter, talk to that guy. Go out there and read it with him. Make conversation that way. You got to end at least somebody that you're social with at this place. And then when you go fill out an application, you say, hey, I've been talking to old so-and-so where you come out and read the meter and I'll give him a hand on that. You know what I can't. Just the end is, is what somebody needs. So if you try to get in it, man, you'll do anything it takes. You know, whatever it takes to get in it. Yeah, I, that's so, really great. Similar advice. I give similar advice. You need to find find it in. It's, it's about relationships. So you have got yeah. to network with people in whatever way you can. Even go to a... Go to a, an electrical convention, you know, like when they have those conventions, like for wind energy, mm -hmm. solar power, whatever it is, like go there and try to meet people there. Be involved, um, yes. Yeah, get involved. Get down, you know, try the union route, try the non union route. Like there's no guarantees because you see that, you see that on TikTok all the time, especially. And I really hate the comment, like, you'll some some old crusty lineman will be like you don't need freaking line school just go to the hall sign the books meanwhile that guy hasn't done that you know it was 25 years ago that he went to the hall and signed the signed the books and tried to be 
like it's not necessarily working anymore. So you got to try everything that you can try. So that's what I tell people, like whatever gets you in the door, just do that thing. If it's line that's school, exactly do that, that thing. If it's the union all, yeah. do that, do all of the things, just get in the door. Cause they'll, hey, they'll hey, ask hey, me, should I do, no, 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 no. should I do contractor or utility? I'm like, what gets you in the door? What, what, <laughs> what opportunity do you have? Just get in the door. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a. At you're right. It's not a choose your game at first. It's getting in the door. Just if the contractor's going to hire you, don't don't take it the wrong way. Get in there with them, and then and then next year, if you don't want to be contractor no more, start calling me. I'll say, hey, I got you experience with contractor, so I'm going to make the shift. Yeah. That box is to come once you're in. You know, once you start making it, paint check on the line crew, options will start showing up. And then when you become an apprentice. Just finish your freaking apprenticeship before you start talking about like going everywhere and traveling and quitting this job to go to that. Just, just finish what you need to do yeah. to finish your apprenticeship. And then you can worry about traveling, and, you know, doing all those things, but just put your head sure. down, finish that three and a half years, get it under your belt. Yeah, that, 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 I would also like to suggest don't, if you don't plan on finishing this the apprenticeship, don't. Don't take it. Yeah. Don't waste everybody's time like that. You know what I mean? Because that's just going to put a bad taste in somebody's mouth for you. And you know, all they're going to do is spit. You know, yeah. I, well, I, worked, well, I worked for a company and we all did that to the guy and he was not happy with that. And um, I felt mad about that ever since. You know what I mean? I was like, man, I should have finished that. But thanks to that guy because he's, he's willing to teach me, you know, and I didn't do it. So. Yeah, if somebody's going to teach you, at least try to listen to them. They'll try to learn a little bit, bro. Because they're not doing it for themselves. That's a fact. That's the other thing you can do is um, is try to set yourself apart from the guy on the street. Like, do some, there's there's things you can do prior to showing up at your union hall or showing up at blind school. Like, you can do for well, some first aid training, get your CDL, you can take a chainsaw course, you can... You know, it's yep. a big deal if you learn how to sharpen a saw and you can hand a sharp saw to your lineman. <laughs> He's going to go, oh, yeah, right, idiot. You know, that's up, right? <laughs> hey, well, that's, that's a damn that's myth on the line right now. <laughs> sharp thing, <laughs> though. <laughs> if you don't go to rock that son of a bitch back and forth on the pole, that, you know, that agree with that. you're getting an apprenticeship yeah. just like that. <laughs> yep. Uh, anything to, anything make you stand out. I didn't even think about it like that. But yeah, you're right. And it, and it could be anything. You know, like knowing how to climb before you ever get there to the big one, you know what I mean? hundred percent. Yeah. There were, we always, uh, and you know how hard linemen are on, a, are on equipment. You know, if you're somewhat of a hand with mechanics, <laughs> like. No, oh, yes. You're, you're the guy. You're the guy. You're in. Like, you're in. You're coming with everybody. Because I guarantee I'm going to break something, and I, I'm not going to know how to fix it, so you're going to be fixing it. Yeah. I got a buddy from high school. I, I went fire lines, and he went mechanic, and now he's a, he's a big wig mechanic for North Houston up there. Yep. Walking old shit all the time. And he was always like that coming up. He's hell, 15, 16 years old. He's laying in the driveway. I was watching him rebuild motors and stuff. You know? I was like, hey, there's something better to do on a Saturday morning than be out here pulling a motor out of this pigot. But that's what he did, and, and now he's, you know, now he's doing it for a living, so. Uh, talk about the importance of uh, work ethic and reputation. The reputation is very important, very important, and it is easy for a good man to get a bad rep, and it don't take just a little bit from a couple of people, and uh, you don't have a bad name on yourself. I had, I had, well, I probably still do. I, I got a lot of people that don't really care for me, but. I guess it was 2014, 2013 or something right there, right after my dad fell off, or he died. I fell off real bad, got back old shit. You know, I kind of, kind of relapsed a minute there, and then I got clean again, and then before I got clean again, I died by some dumb shit, and uh, nobody really wanted anything to do with me. And I I told my wife, I don't know if I was, yeah, I, I get hired on again. I said, I said, ain't nobody wants me out there. Well, uh, this one old guy said he's going to stick his neck out for me. And he didn't regret it. He, when I walked in, he knew that I was top line when I walked in that door and I proved it to him, you know. Uh, ever since then, I've, I've been try really trying to keep, you know, at least an edge on my name that ain't, 
so sharp and just runs everybody off. I mean, I might be an abrasive fella, but I try to be knowledgeable and polite in what I'm doing. I'm not mean to anybody unnecessarily. But drugs will damn sure do it. If you get twisted off and that shit real bad, and that you'll get that name, and then nobody will watch you out there. It's, it's just unsafe, you know what I mean? So, reputation is more, more important than, I'd say, your ability. Because if everybody knows you're a so-so hand and a good guy, that you're, you're going to get hired on because of that reason. But if everybody knows you're a jam-up hand with 900,000 problems and terrible attitude about it, Nobody wants to to do with that guy, so he's he's nine times out of ten he's blackballed, <laughs> and it's no place to be at. No, no, and it uh, your reputation um, beats you to the job site. <laughs> beats you to the right, it does. Beats you to the next job site. So it's a like question I get asked quite often as well. Or you just see it, you just see it, right? A hand will show up, and you'll be like, "No, stay away from that guy." I'd be like, "I don't even know who that guy is." And it's like, he's this. He's right away. This, he's done you that. can tell. Yeah, right away. I got asked the other day, uh, I was doing a live. Uh, this kid asked me if, if I thought my TikTok page had hard my, my power line career. I didn't know what to say to that. I mean, possibly, you know, I don't know. I hate to think it's something like it would, you know, but. At the same time, it, you know, it may have, it, it, it may hurt me in the long run. I don't know. I hope you got it, though. But when he asked me that, I didn't know how to answer it. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I don't really know if it did or not. So we're just kind of hoping for the best now. I think that if you just, you know, stick to a set of values and Correct. and hold fast to that and don't let, you know, I can't. I've got shit comments in the past that want, want like that make me want to like lash out just with everything I've got saying like you don't know what oh, you're yeah. fucking saying you don't know what you're saying you don't know what you're talking about you don't know anything about me you know like you just you don't know what you're talking about and you just want to you want to lash out but they're just those guys are just coming from a bad place like they're coming from a bad place and that's what you got to remember is if they're going to show up on your page and be all negative and be shitty they must be just yeah. a sh in a shit place themselves. And I'd rather help that person than lash out at them and make them, you know, make people around them lash out at them because they don't know what they're talking about. So it's just, it's just unfortunate, yeah. but you got to brush it off. I don't think it's going to end your, yeah. your page, I have your career at all. If it's coming from a good place. Yeah. Yeah. I believe so. I see a lot of shit on TikTok that, as far, you know, <laughs> less respectful about things that, that my channel is. So hopefully it's just something that I throw around, you know what I mean? I, for some reason, I'm the kind of guy that I get, I get it in my head where I, I'm all run any situation that I get around, you know what I mean? If I try to do more than my due diligence to make sure the situation is right. And I think, I don't know if I attribute that to, to a lot of my failures or to a lot of my successes, but. That's just the way I feel about it. I, I try, I try my damnedest to make sure that everybody's happy, you know, and and not upset about something or missing the point or missing context. I don't want that for nobody, you know. So that's the good thing with TikTok. You don't keep like, on doing. You can reply to those con those comments with more context. Yeah. I really like that part. You can post that comment up there, and then you can go further into what you were saying. Yes. Maybe you it out more. You're sure. There's some context in that post, but like, here's, we're going to talk about it again. We're going to go another layer deeper. I'm going to explain myself a little bit more and you do a good job at that. Like what is, what's your plans with your TikTok page? Uh, I just keep going. I'm going to go more, just, there's more not time, the splicings and stuff like that. Uh, but I'm going to try to get some transformers that's been that's gone bad in the field. I want to open them up, got to get down inside of them, see, see exactly what faults inside the pot. You know, a lot of guys don't know that. I, hell, I don't know what, what faults inside them. I've been in a hard enough because I thought they had copper in them, but I was sadly mistaken when I cracked her open and she's full of metal. 
I want my payday up first, uh, listen, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll bet you the jackpot, bro. <laughs> and you put this ball of fucking rattle. <laughs> that <was> terrible on <laughs> me. But yeah, I mean, I want to do that, you know, just got to just gotta get more in depth into it. I kind of want to pursue this interviews in some of these hands that I've, I'm on here with. It's kind of like a like a live deal, you know what I mean? We get on there, you know, three or four boxes of people t- talking back and forth and I don't know, just to keep it fun and then I, I expect it to plateau. They've they've had my one account under a strike and then they give it another one and another one and I wore my appeal this morning so they gave me my channel back. Hmm. And that's what I figure will happen though. Over time, I, I think I might have just got lucky getting big on the first channel and then I figured it'll get bad, and then what's the uh, uh, what's the the deal? Like, what could, you're going against some sort of community? So, by guy. Yeah, so the first one I I, I shared a, a a post off of Tom Mary page, and it was this bull fighting a guy out in the pasture, and they pulled up in his car to pick the guy up, and uh, he climbs on top of the van. So when they gas it, the guy falls off the van, and <laughs> then back up and pick him up. It's funny. Yeah. they flagged it that was my first flag right there then they got a video of, uh, i did for them where a guy was falling off pole on a boat squeeze and then i put it with beside one of an old cat back in the old days that fell off the pole cutting a dummy loose he fell out on his head you know with no boat squeeze and i just kind of compared it to they flagged that one man it's it's these little stuff like dangerous activities like he gets flagged for promoting dangerous activities hey and they may be right i guess technically that shit's dangerous, but I'm not promoting it. You know what I mean? I just kind of highlight it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what they keep jabbing me over, stuff like that. So, like, I had a video sent to me this morning, and it was uh, two guys opening up a cat bait. And uh, couldn't, one, one cut out fired up, and they was trying to open the other side up. Well, you don't do that. Or when, they, when they went to open that other side up, the whole sub bitch blew up all of you. You know what I mean? So, I said, oh, I ain't sharing that one. Not much as I want everybody to see that. That's something TikTok flagged me for, you know what I mean? So I can't highlight that. And and that's all it was. So I started a new play. I got a backup account. It's good to the John too. What are what are the two accounts? Let's know. Uh, one of them uh, first my main page is good to the John. Uh it's got my face. And then my second page is good to the John too. T O O. My face on there. Goodies, my nickname. I I say I Got busy with storms here. And I'm putting together a few videos here. I was going to do the transformer thing. I'm going to do some rope splicing here. And I'll get some more stuff out there eventually. Just I got 900 kinds of irons in the fire. You know, I got my mama's house been wrecked out. And I, I've got, I'm trying to work, you know, and it's just, it, it culminates into one big fiasco, but I'm, I'm slowly, slowly getting it panned out. Uh, well, slow and steady wins the race, man. Honestly, that's how, yeah, that's sir, how yeah, this, podcast, this podcast started out that way too. Just was doing it out of the corner of my apartment. I think that podcast is awesome too. Yeah. I've been yeah so we, getting that, reaching out and talking with folks. You should record, uh, you should record your lives and yeah. just put those out as podcasts. Cause I'm sure like the conversations okay. you're going to have in your lives um i'm sure there's great content out of that right and it's it's a shame for like a great conversation yeah. with another hand to just go f- you know for the 100 or 200 yeah that's good I, will, I will i will record those conversations and just put those out as you know like goodies recordings or something i don't know yeah uh, good um, that's a good idea right i appreciate that yeah that's a good way yeah. to start i got that yeah uh, right it is yeah a very good way because this you're right it, it they're pretty raw conversations being held, you know what I mean, in the moment. So yeah, that's a good idea. If you that's use a if you use a a podcast hosting provider like Anchor, Anchor's free, um, and it, it Anchor will uh, Anchor will host your podcast, and then it will distribute that to all of the podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcast, and and all of those ones. So. You just have to host it on the one hosting provider, and uh, it will distribute it to all the platforms. Oh, that's awesome! Mm-hmm. But if you, uh, so it really limits your amount of like the work that you have to do. You don't have to go post. Yeah, it. so you can just yeah upload it to one place. Yeah, 
yeah, I got a YouTube account and I, uh, I barely go to, I mean, I watch a lot of YouTube, but I don't hardly post anything over there. All that I should do that more, but it's a great, it's a good so, service too for like, if you're going to record yeah. those, like I would suggest even put them out there, just put them on YouTube. Yeah. I was doing that with, uh, my initial podcast. I, I was, uh, just doing the audio recording. I would just put a, a logo over it for an hour and a half and I just put that on YouTube yeah. and they're getting listens. They're getting views. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, that's what I'll do, man. I, I definitely plan on, you know, I've reached out to a couple of people and they're all on board with it. I just can't wait on my channel to get on back. Every minute they didn't think it was going to, but I got an email this morning at three o'clock and so I, I won that. So now I'm going to reach out to a couple of guys and see what would be good days for them, you know. I got, I got two trucks broke down right now and then two different parts of Texas. So I got that to cover up and now, I mean, I, I'm fixing to get real busy again, but I, I'm going to do something. I figure all my days off will be my busy week because I do eight, six hits. So on that six day off, that'd probably be what I do a couple of lives. We'll try to expand a little bit. Good, um, good ways to cover off content while you're, you know, while you're working as well. Like if you've got any, any drive time, travel time, and you're sitting with another hand, just a, a couple yeah. of microphones plugged into your phone even just record yeah. that and record those conversations you're having just in the truck driving down the road, right? And then, wow. Well, yep. That's that good idea. Yep. Yeah. Well, here's some of the best conversations about today on the ride is. Yeah, so. Absolutely. And there's, there's where things stuff. went right, where things went wrong, stuff like that. Yeah. And it's, it's cool because yeah, you, you're talking about a job you were just doing, right? And you're like, uh, you're going through the good things, the bad things, what you could change, what you could do different. And that's real. Like that's, that's an everyday on the job type of scenario, right? Where you get back in the truck, you're heading back to the show up and if yep. you're talking about the job you're doing. Yeah, that's right. Cool, John. Well, I've had you for an hour and a half an hour before, so I appreciate your time. Yeah. Sorry about the way that messed up the first time. Man. No, I'm going to, I'm going to use it. We're, we're going to splice it together. Just like a good chunk yep. of rope, and we'll make it work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm about to, there's a rope spots in Taylorsville. Nice. Well, I'll, I'll put that out there. I think I will try to climb a pole here pretty quick too. Cool. But think about it. Going through the motions and all. I think I'm gonna fix some do that video as well. So. Oh, I got a big ass pine tree. I fixed the saw down too. I want to do that for video. I'm gonna cut down like no big trees. I got a pine tree a hundred foot tall. Fix some drop. Heck, I'll stay tuned for that one. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be waiting to see it. <laughs> it might be the rest of my mama's house. We don't know yet. <laughs> well, <laughs> Ryan, man, I appreciate it, Bo. Yeah. Let me know if I, I talk to you if I can do anything to help promote you. And, uh, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. If I can do anything for you, let me know. It's good talking to you. For sure, man. All right, buddy. Take care, man. Bye.